Good afternoon. We'll, we'll speak not exactly about uh, what our model is, but how to study the results of your model. Once you have a model and you have plenty of results, what can you do with all of that? Our model has been already presented in many TA conferences, well published. We are studying some um, ideas related with the origins, the emergence of cultural diversity among homogeneous population. Imagine originally a population of very simple population, hunter-gatherers, living in a non-homogeneous but not a strictly random, uh, random landscape, and we ask whether some form of cultural diversity can emerge even in the case you don't have any kind of geographical barrier to isolate populations. The main idea in our model is that as a consequence of labor cooperation, it appears some tendency to homogeneous, to cultural consensus, and to negotiate the possibilities of uh, diversity. Groups diverse in a relatively random way, but as soon as they find another enough compatible group, they exchange labor and they exchange cultural elements between them. As you see that our model has been already published and preliminary versions of the code have been uploaded to open ABM. In general, our model implies that uh, there are some variations in the local conditions for survival. These variations are motivated by natural environment, the lack of resources, for instance, but also for social environment, the amount of neighbors that a group may have. Then groups, to survive, they should create, build some form of cultural consensus. And cultural consensus is made through cooperation, exchanging labor. If you exchange labor, then you have a tendency to reduce cultural diversity. If you don't have the opportunity to exchange labor, then your cultural diversity increases because the rhythm of uh, cultural diversity and heterogeneity is relatively constant, or we have modeled it as constant. In general, the model, as you see, that's the more of the characteristics of the agents. We have some different properties about uh, the age of them, the amount of energy, of very important, the culture. Yeah. Evidently, culture, we have to use it here, the axel rot idea of theory of a culture identified as a single vector. And there are some different procedures for uh, living, for hunting, gathering, and exchanging labor enough to, uh, in order to obtain much more uh, probability of successful when hunting animals. This is a fast image of uh, how the, the program, the simulation looks like. You have here in the, the bottom some of the inputs, and the last line, there are the outputs of the line, and some plenty of monitors that we have to understand what the model is doing. Here you have mm, one way of, uh, one image of the running. Uh, the system is able to create some influence areas. These influence areas are more or less what in archaeology we call an archaeological culture. That is the mm, geographical distance of all agents that are sharing the same culture. As you see, theoretically, not very strict territories should appear in this idea that we are simulating. Well, we don't speak about the model, but we have run the model. How to validate? We have discussed in the theoretical session why to model, those, what does it mean to validate? But we think that models should not be validated. Remember that I think that the model is just a formal deduction, and models should be verified, if you will. Because if it's very well, it's well programmed, then you have a formal deduction from your initial assumptions. Another thing if, is whether the results of the model fit 
your data from reality. What we have made here is a kind of sensitivity analysis. Instead of uh, analyzing validation, we are trying to understand what is possible within this formal method without taking into account reality. That will be come later. So our general idea is, can we predict some different aspects, some different elements? So it's possible to predict the demographic stability of a population depending on different scenarios, rich scenario, poor scenario, rich or poor in resources. Can we uh, understand the economic reproductive success? In which cases all this population will die because of lack of resources, because of lack of possibilities of sharing or cooperation, etc. We are specifically looking for the very last things. So, can territoriality emerge among hunter-gatherers where there are not geographical barriers and where at starting up you are beginning with an homogeneous population? In which conditions these forms of territoriality may appear? And of course, the evolution of technological efficiency because we have here two different sources of possibility of success. You can increase cooperation the more people cooperate, but if you need more people, it's necessary that all people share more or less the same technological efficiency. If you are looking for uh, increasing your efficiency, you are increasing also the difference with other people, and you are decreasing the possibility of uh, cooperation. Well, we have to explore the parametric space, and we have 11 inputs and six different outputs. So here you have the main inputs, the initial population, the main resources of the different parts on the area, the average level. Each agent is a household, but the number of people in each household and the proportion of children or seniors without the ability to work in the same sense of adults can vary. We have the average technology. Each agent has a technology with some degree of efficiency. It, we have divided technology of uh, performing, of killing animals, for instance, and the technology of storing. If you have some technology to store subsistence, you can obtain different results. Movement, uh, uh, the main thing is when you have some technology to increase your movement radio, for instance, horse or transportation means. The diversity, the amount of diversity among all agents in the system, and this internal change rate. That's the amount of discovery of the possibilities a single group has to develop their own culture, their own technology. And these are the five ways we have to measure the rest. Because we are looking for cultural diversity, we should measure how different groups are different, considering the input, the culture of each agent. So we are studying socio-fractionalization, depth of differences, generalization of fractionalization, generalized resemblance, and a new index of our generalized spatial aggregation and territoriality. The main thing is these indexes are not invented by us. These indexes exist in the anthropological and sociological literature. Most of them come from index of comparing languages. And our main interest is to understand if the social indexes existing in the literature to compare social diversity, cultural diversity, they can be used to monitor what the system is doing. Well, we have run our model. We have just a uh, network of behavioral space. <coughs> but this is a very complicated model with also complex uh, relationships. So there are more than 11,000 permutations. Things that we have made for that. We have reduced everything in the model to increase speed, of course, no monitors at all, not screen at all, and everything. 
But even in those cases, the time of, for doing is really very, very hard, depending on the number of agents. We have divided three, uh, four different scenarios, one with 10 agents at start up. You can end up with 1,000 agents after reproduction, with 100 agents at starting up, with 200 agents or 400 agents at starting up. As you see, that's, uh, there are plenty of time for calculations. Problem is the prehistoric uh, technology we are using. We try to create a very, very small grid of just three computers because of um, calendar problems or computers were in uh, for classroom uses. So we have only used four different computers in very, very, very limited parallel implementation. Each run produce four different files. And the most important thing is to remember is that each file has a completely different structure. In the first case, we are running here. Uh, we have the agent file with all characteristics of agents as changing at different cycles, at different ticks using NetLogo Jargoon. As you see, that each agent can move. You can change the, the coordinates. They have different levels of energy at different ticks at different moments of time. Second file, you have some very general ideas about the group of agents. That means the idea of collectivities of agents. In this case, you also have the state of the agent at different ticks. In general, uh, general structure for the super agent farm, so the, the collective of collectives. We have organized files in different way. So the number of files related with the first scenario, that's a very uh, small initial population with two different scenarios of increased population at starting up and some simulations with the 400 agents at starting up. The result, as you see here, is more than one million files because we have repeated 40 times each run for each parameter combination. The result is uh, five terabytes of data and more than uh, billions of data and billions not in the English system but billions in the European system that is more than 1,000 million. What can we do with all of that? So we want to analyze all those data, but how to analyze that? How to have an idea of the parametric space of everything what is possible within this huge increasing spatial uh, possibility of space? Miguel will explain now how we are trying to process all this huge big data. Okay, perfect. As Juan said, you have at the very beginning the model, and you have yes, no, anterior, right? okay. Uh, okay, you have the model at the very beginning. You run the model, and as you usually use system-based testing, in some moment you have the problem you generate a quantity of data which is unmanageable using traditional tools like, I don't know, for Linux people open office, for Microsoft people, Microsoft Office, and this kind of tool. So you need something else because five terabytes of data cannot be managed, nor need a processor using this kind of tools. You have to think out of the box. In computer science, in this case, thinking out of the box means using a data server. So we put all the data into the data server, and then we make you show it in a moment, uh, the extraction, what to do with the data, with this quantity of data, which is a bit C of data and also very deep, we have to make some operations in order to 
be processing the results because we don't know at the very beginning if we are duplicating some data or even though if we have hidden information we have not analyzed it yet. Okay, as Joan said, you have four files for the run and there is five terabytes of data. And the first thing you have to do when you're in a situation like that is try to organize the files. To organize that structure of the data in a way you can manage later. And at the very first beginning, a pair appears relations between all the elements of the data. Of the data, if you have four files or a million files, they are not isolated, they are not alone. They are, they are related somehow, and in this case, with the number of the agent. And the logo is able to generate a unique number of the agent. So in the files, we relate the information that we have at the output using this number. That permits for us to make uh, integration of all this data in order to make the final step that the one explained in a moment, which is the, that data analysis. Okay, as you have seen, first of all, there's the raw data. In the raw data, we put it in a database server, and in the database server, the first thing you have to do is, okay, with all this information, how I ask the database server to make for the information that I want to know. So we use uh, MySQL, a structured query language, which is a usual tool in computer science, in order to obtain just the bits, the kind of information we are interested in. So we have to construct a lot of them. And that's the first step in order to know what do we have. And to discover if we have somehow um, duplicated or repeated information. As you see here, okay, we have made integration, we have made some queries. Sorry, a query is, uh, is to ask for data in the database server. And okay, we have to extract to work with all this information. Is it manageable? And it's very difficult to do something with them. So we have to pull, we have to cut all the information we think is duplicated and the information we know are not useful for what we are asking for. Because, of course, in the run, as the run takes a lot of days, you say, okay, I put inside more information that, that I need because later, if I want to do something, I do it with all the information that I have. So you cut the information and you cut and remove the duplication. And you use the query language in order to extract the information. One? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, right. Perfect. You can see here some sentence which are uh, made against the database server in order to have the information. With all this information, okay. Go to the Sí, Okay. Well, with all this information, I can do some extraction of the data. But the most important thing we want to do is to make a new database just with the information they they need to make the analysis. And with these analyses. A database server doesn't do that, but R, for instance, and this kind of statistic tools are able to make all the data analysis, which is a part that Juan will explain to you to get the results. So we don't have still the final results, but now we have converted an initial database of billions of data into a just single database with 30,000 characteristics of ticks. Now we can begin to do more classical statistical tests. We are trying to look for the stochastic um, sources of variation within the data and to understand everything, trying to look for nonlinear correlations between inputs and outputs and using also 
some intermediate variables that we know they are related with the inputs, but sometimes they are much clearer. They give more information than just the raw input. So we are now studying the different possibilities to understand in which way the variations and starting uh, population affect the possibilities of obtaining different values of cultural diversity, the, in, the influence of uh, the amount of resources that can uh, affect in this way, the consequences of cooperation for the evolution of technology and different parameters as you one can see. So this is again this idea of investigating the ethnogenesis, so cultural diversity, as differences in the pattern of cooperation among groups. We have to understand why people arrive to cooperate for understanding the consequences of cooperation. Of course, agents have the right to decide, I don't want to cooperate, or they can understand the benefits of cooperation. Once you understand the mechanism of the emergence, the origins of cooperation, you can understand the consequence of cooperation for survival, but also for other relatively important aspects like cultural diversity, which is something that we can observe in the archaeological record. Thank you very much.